Jogger. Strenuous workout has you feeling better today. What about tomorrow? The hope, of course, is that it will bring you many more tomorrows and more healthful ones. But will it? That's the question many people were asking this summer, following the death by heart attack of jogging authority Jim Fix. He, more than anyone, had helped to make jogging a national pastime. And since his death, doctors have been taking a hard second look at exercise in general. To help us understand what they've learned, we were able to call on our own medical expert and a new contributor to 2020, Dr. Tim Johnson. Melvin Frank, a 59-year-old business executive from Providence, Rhode Island, is a believer in exercise. For 20 years, he has been very active, running, skiing, playing golf, and tennis. For the last four years, he jogged 15 miles a week. Then, last year, something very unexpected happened to Melvin Frank. November and December, I started to get some chest pains and while I was running. And at first, I thought, well, this must be just congestion or a cold. I didn't even dream that it could have been anything to do with my heart. Within weeks, Melvin had seen his doctor and was scheduled for an exercise stress test. He was able to stay on the treadmill for only two minutes, suggesting that this seemingly healthy fit man might indeed have heart disease. Within a week, he had a cardiac catheterization, which can show the location and extent of blockage in the coronary arteries. He's got a very tight uh, LAD lesion right there. His films reveal that one coronary artery was 70% blocked, and another 95% blocked. Never thought it could happen to me. I really, it was complete surprise. I thought, I guess we all think we, were, we are immortal. And I think I thought I was more immortal than most people. The story of Melvin Frank raises many questions, questions that have become increasingly public since the death of running guru Jim Fix. For example, does it really pay to exercise in terms of reducing the risk of heart disease? If so, how much exercise is necessary? And what about the dangers? And how can we as individuals minimize any dangers should we choose to exercise? Surprisingly, the answers to those questions are just beginning to emerge because devotion to vigorous exercise is a relatively recent phenomenon in this country. Among the first physicians to popularize the link between exercise and health was Dr. Paul Dudley White of Boston, President Eisenhower's physician following his heart attack. In the early 60s, President Kennedy set a national example that emphasized physical fitness, football, sailing, and other sports. In the late 60s, the more scientific word aerobics was introduced into the public vocabulary by Air Force flight surgeon Dr. Kenneth Cooper. His 1968 bestseller offered Americans a specific program of vigorous exercise. The 1972 Olympic Games in Munich sparked a specific interest in running when Frank Shorter became the first American to win the marathon in 64 years. However, it wasn't an athlete, but a writer who really got America running. Jim Fix's complete book of running was on the bestseller list more than a year. And within a few years, Fix also came out with a home videotape. And so over the years, I've discovered, as I hope you will, if you haven't already, the, this extraordinary range of benefits of running. Amidst this euphoria, however, were some danger signals. Three, three, four. In 1978, Maryland Congressman Goodloe Byron, age 49, collapsed and died while jogging. His autopsy revealed a heart attack caused by narrowed coronary arteries. Other deaths among runners were increasingly reported in the scientific journals and popular press. But the death that truly stunned runners and many non-runners was that of Jim Fix, who died on July 20th of this year while running in the hills of Vermont. An autopsy showed that Fix, at age 52, had two coronary arteries almost completely blocked. Within weeks of Fix's death, and in a stunning stroke of coincidence, New York cardiologist Dr. Henry Solomon burst on the publishing scene with a book that had actually been two years in the planning. Provocatively entitled The Exercise Myth, the book pulls together most of the questions concerning exercise effectiveness and safety that have been growing in the public mind. Now actively on the media circuit, Dr. Solomon has become a focal point for the anti-exercise movement. We caught up with him recently in Boston to see how he would put his case in person. Exercise will not make you live longer. It will not give you a healthier heart. 
it will not prevent heart attacks, it will not improve your coronary circulation, and it will greatly enhance your risks of dying suddenly. In order to examine those charges, also made by others, we have spent the last two months taking a hard look at all of the major studies on exercise done during the past 30 years. We have also talked extensively to four leading experts in the exercise field, all of whom have serious reservations about most of the charges made by Dr. Solomon. We have asked them to help us present a balanced picture on the real benefits versus the real risks associated with exercise. We'd like you to meet our experts. Dr. Kenneth Cooper, father of the aerobics movement, is founder of the Institute for Aerobics in Dallas, which is pumping three and a half million dollars this year alone into studies of exercise and health. Dr. Ralph Pavenbarger of Stanford and Harvard has published some of the most important research on the link between exercise and heart disease prevention. Dr. William Costelli is medical director of the world-famous Framingham Heart Study, which has produced volumes of research on the risk factors for heart disease. And Dr. Paul Thompson, a cardiologist at Brown University and Miriam Hospital in Rhode Island, is a leading expert on the risks of exercise. All these experts are also runners. Dr. Thompson, in fact, runs competitively. And while they practice what they preach, they also admit, in different ways, that the benefits of exercise have often been overstated. I think that we in the medical profession, or at least some of us in the medical profession, are guilty of overselling it, and that what you're seeing now is the backlash. And I would even plead guilty to making statements back in the late 60s that were not correct. For example, I used to make the statement that exercise overcomes many, if not all, of the deleterious effects of diet. Dr. Cooper no longer teaches that. Today, both in his latest book and at the Aerobic Center, he emphasizes the importance of diet and other factors and stresses that exercise alone is not enough to prevent heart disease. Nonetheless, he is still a believer. The Institute claims to have the largest exercise computerized database anywhere in the world, and they are now using that data to demonstrate ways in which exercise may reduce the risk for heart disease. In July, his researchers reported their current findings on the effects of exercise specifically on blood pressure. This study and others show that exercise can help to prevent the development of high blood pressure, at least in some people. Most people in the high categories of fitness were much less likely to develop high blood pressure if their blood pressure was normal when they started the program, as compared to people in the low categories of fitness. A marked difference there, highly significant. The second major risk factor that can often be improved with exercise is blood cholesterol. When people have their blood drawn, it can be analyzed not only for the total cholesterol level, but for the various types that make up that total. One of those types is called HDL cholesterol, and it is seen here at the bottom of the test tube. Researchers call this good cholesterol because there is increasing evidence that people with high levels of HDL, or good cholesterol, have a lower rate of heart disease. Studies here in Rhode Island and elsewhere have shown a correlation between exercise and higher HDL levels. There's lots of evidence, very good evidence, that um, exercise can change the, the uh, pattern of, of blood cholesterol in a favorable manner. Raise the level of HDL, which is thought to be the good cholesterol. However, most people who exercise for health reasons do so not because of blood pressure or cholesterol, but because of a fear of having a heart attack. Indeed, many people simply accept as fact that proper exercise can prevent heart disease. That belief is rooted medically in studies that have looked at large groups of people over a long period of time and found apparently lower risks for heart disease in those who are most active. The first such study was done in the mid-50s in London, where researchers examined the heart attack rate among the different workers on the famous double-decker buses. They found that the more active conductors who climbed up and down steps all day had fewer deaths from heart attacks compared to the drivers who sat all day. This lowered risk from exercise was further studied by Dr. Paffenbarger. He surveyed nearly 17,000 Harvard alumni, some dating back to 1916, about their physical activity since leaving college, how many stairs they climbed, how many blocks they walked, and what kind of sports they played. The results, published in a landmark study in 1978, gave a major scientific boost to the idea that exercise can reduce heart disease risk. The more active, the more fit, the lower the risk. However, as important as this kind of evidence is, our experts acknowledge that it is not perfect. 
On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate the certainty of our evidence linking exercise to a decreased risk for heart disease? Well, I'd have to put it up around 7 or 8 or so. And not 10? Not 10. I would rate them probably 7 to 8. 7? We should point out that even though our experts recognize the problems of exercise studies, as indicated in their 7 to 8 rating, they all agree with the bottom line, that people who are more active are less likely to develop heart disease. However, that's a generalization which does not adequately emphasize another important point, that for some people, exercise can be deadly. In other words, even though there are real benefits, there are also real dangers. Indeed, the recent New York Marathon reminded us of the very real dangers posed by exercise when a 48-year-old French runner collapsed here in Queens at the 14-mile point of that race. He died within hours at a nearby hospital. And even though he had known heart disease, his death became a graphic example of the very real dangers posed by exercise for some people. Dr. Paul Thompson was one of the first scientists to systematically study that danger. Working with the medical examiner, Dr. Thompson looked at the cause of death in 12 men in Rhode Island who died while jogging during a six-year period. It was determined that 11 of the 12 died of coronary artery disease. That figure underscores the fact that people who die while jogging usually have heart disease, whether they know it or not. Thompson then made a series of calculations and came up with the conclusion that the death rate during jogging in a general population is about seven times that during more sedentary activities like sitting in a chair or watching TV. Does this suggest, as Dr. Solomon maintains, that jogging is dangerous? We've done other studies looking at who dies during exertion. In, in general, these people either knew they had a problem or had symptoms before they dropped dead. We think it's very rare for someone to be totally well and struck down like by a thunderbolt. I think that that happens very rarely. Does it happen at all? I think it must happen occasionally, but it's very rare. The question of risks versus benefits was addressed head-on in a study published last month which looked at exercise-related deaths during a 14-month period in the Seattle area. As widely reported, the results of that study strongly suggest that the temporary risks of dying during exercise are indeed outweighed by the long-term benefits if exercise is vigorous and regular. However, while such data are reassuring, the question remains for each individual, is it possible for me to find out if I am at special risk for dying during exercise? Just past 2420, ask again, you want to stop at 2430, you want to keep going? Go. The usual answer involves taking a stress test, an electrocardiogram done while the heart is being forced to work hard during exercise. Traditional advice implies that persons over age 35 or 40 would be wise to have such a test before starting a vigorous exercise program. However, increasing questions are being raised about that advice. I don't believe that everyone who's starting an exercise program needs a stress test. I think what they need is a, is a dose of common sense. And that is that they have to start out slowly, and they have to pay attention to themselves. It is important to understand that what most experts are questioning is the value of stress testing in usually healthy people. However, when a stress test shows a problem, there is no question about its value for that person. If I put you on the treadmill and you get certain changes on that treadmill, I'm 100% sure from those changes that you have heart disease. I'd like to know that. So, who should have a stress test? In other words, how can we narrow down the field to those more likely to have abnormal results? My own list of those who should have one would include the following. Those with a family history of premature vascular disease, meaning relatives having heart attacks or strokes in their 30s, 40s, even 50s. Also, those with a past or current history of symptoms suggestive of heart disease, especially chest, neck, or arm discomfort that occurs with exertion and gets better with rest. I would also personally advise those persons over age 35 or 40 who have been sedentary and are now embarking on a vigorous exercise program to have a stress test, especially if they are unwilling to proceed cautiously. Finally, I would also point out that all of our experts stress the importance of paying attention to warning symptoms, no matter how fit a person may seem. Any time a person has pain or discomfort with exercise, particularly in the chest. But also discomfort that's felt in the epigastrium or the stomach area, in the throat, in the jaw, 
in the shoulders and in the arms. If they don't heed that sound, that warning, uh, they're going to drop dead running from their heart attack, just like Mr. Fix did, even though they're up there in that wonderful Vermont air. So let's assume you're now at a point where you've listened to the experts, you've weighed all the evidence, and you've decided to take the relatively small risks involved in an exercise program. We now come to the all-important question, how much exercise should you do to reap cardiovascular benefits? While experts cannot be exactly precise, most would agree with the following guidelines, that cardiovascular fitness can be achieved by exercise that involves large muscle groups on a non-stop basis for about 25 to 30 minutes, done three to five times per week, and at a target heart rate that is typically determined by age. Surprisingly, this means considerably less exercise than might be expected. Running, for example. If you run more than 15 miles a week, you're running for something other than cardiovascular fitness. Because beyond that point, we document minimal improvement in the cardiovascular system as measured by the maximal oxygen consumption. But we document a marked increase in musculoskeletal injury. Besides running, other exercises that can achieve this goal include swimming, bicycling, and cross-country skiing. Which brings us back to Melvin Frank, who did almost all of those things and still got heart disease. Melvin is fortunate. He flirted with danger, ignoring chest pains for two months. But he finally sought help. His stress test led him to surgery. And today, he is back at work and participating in an exercise program for heart patients. The experts cannot tell Melvin or anyone that exercise will always help to prevent heart problems. And they cannot tell him or anyone exactly how much will bring a benefit or who for sure is in danger. But in the battle against America's number one killer, it is encouraging to know that the case is building for finding an important weapon right at our feet. I think the exercise that I did over my life helped me. There's nothing, I, I don't think I could have done anything about the blocked arteries. We can't fight what's inside us, but we can do the best we can. Tim, primarily you're talking about jogging in this piece as related to heart mm -hmm. disease. What about other exercises that men do, like uh, weightlifting or, you know, all the exercising? Good? Bad? Well, they may be good for other purposes, but the only kinds of exercise that can qualify for aerobic and therefore for cardiovascular benefit are those that are done according to the criteria. That is, they have to be nonstop without slowing down for between 15 and 60 minutes, at least three times a week, etc. Yeah. Weightlifting is obviously just short bursts of activity. Wouldn't qualify for aerobic, may build your muscles, but it won't help your heart. What about women? I mean, we jog and we dance and, you know. You know, it's interesting because we don't pay as much attention to women and probably for good medical reason. That is, they are well protected, at least until the age of menopause in most cases, against heart disease. So we've worried more about men because they are the ones who have heart attacks in their 40s and 50s. Yeah. But obviously women could benefit also and certainly past the age of menopause it would make good sense for a cardiovascular program. Couldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Well, later on in our broadcast, you're going to meet a woman whose incredible spirit could make the whole world smile. Bob Brown, with the lady they call Mrs. T. She truly is something special. But next, we've been watching the drama of Baby Faye. And this man discovered a drug that is helping transplant patients beat the rejection factor. Right after this. AT&T is in paper, trucks, software. How? With a new program called AT&T Opportunity Calling for Business. It can help small business earn a dollar's credit on these and other name brand products for each dollar spent on AT&T long distance service. That's savings off the best price you can find. Our catalog is coming to your office. Look for it. AT&T Communications. We can help your business in ways you never thought of. We shaped the Mercury Cougar to help the car hug the highway. It's a shape you'll always feel good in. Just like that old leather jacket. Cougar. From Mercury.
There's more for your life at Sears. Catch a silver unicorn. Catch one now. You'll save more. All silver unicorn sportswear is 25% off. Wool sweaters, cotton shirts, comfy pants, pleated skirts. 25% off silver unicorn for juniors. Colors, pow, styles, wow. All silver unicorn sportswear is 25% off. But you've got to be quick to catch a silver unicorn. Sale ends Saturday. There's more for your life at Sears. We weren't planning to go to Midas on our honeymoon, but we didn't have much choice. The brakes on my old Camaro were making a terrible noise, so we pulled into Midas and showed them my guarantee. And now you're uh, Pat Fitzsimmons? I am. <laughs> Used to be. Midas fixed the brakes right away, and because of the guarantee, the brake shoes were free. I guess something always goes wrong on your wedding day. It's a good thing we could go to Midas. Trust the Midas touch. Friday, Max's ex-partner comes to town and brings nothing but trouble. Police! Police! Hawaiian heat. Then, a cover girl killer stalks the city. How many women has he killed? Can Matt Houston stop him before he strikes again? All starting at 9, 8 central. Tomorrow. Now, the miracle of organ transplants and the battle to fight rejection... Tonight in Loma Linda, California, baby Faye is alive because of the baboon's heart that she received in a transplant operation. Also, TV star Gary Coleman is in good condition after his second kidney transplant. And recently, the tragic death of actor John Eric Hexum meant life for a Las Vegas man who received Hexum's heart. In all of these cases, a drug called cyclosporin is helping the patients fight the rejection factor. Because just as our body fights to reject a germ or a piece of ragweed pollen, so too it fights to reject almost any donor organ. And as doctors in the Baby Faye case have indicated, cyclosporin holds new promise for making organ transplants a success. Two years ago, ABC News followed a team of doctors as they rushed through the night to retrieve the heart of a brain-dead 21-year-old whose heart was kept beating through machine intervention in order that it could be donated in an attempt to save the life of another young man, 65 miles away, whose own heart was failing him. They've got the elevator and everything down there? Yeah, they don't have the This would be approximately the 400th heart transplant since Dr. Christian Barnard made history with the procedure in 1967. Well, good, good luck. In the decade that followed, the long and complex surgical techniques were perfected. But doctors were unable to solve the bigger problem, the mystery of rejection. For in most cases, the body's own immune system rejected the transplanted organ as if it were a foreign invader. But what would make this operation different and a success was a new anti-rejection drug called cyclosporin, an experimental drug introduced in 1979 that many are calling a miracle drug because it suppresses the immune system while still allowing the body to protect itself against infection. Today, it is marketed under the brand name of Sandimmune. It is FDA approved, and in the first days after baby Faye's operation, her doctor made it clear that cyclosporin was the drug that had made it all possible. She uh, was preoperatively prepared with cyclosporin, and we followed her levels very carefully, uh, virtually hour by hour. We stand alone, I think, in our research in this effort because I think we're the only people on the globe that have experimented with cyclosporin in the newborn period. Cyclosporin is produced by the Sandoz Company, whose policy is to ask vacationing employees to bring back handfuls of dirt from around the world to analyze for new substances. In dirt brought back from Norway, Dr. Jean Borel discovered fungus spores that, when tested, suppressed the immune system. I was looking for other types of activities for immunosuppressants, anti-cancer drugs. And when I received the substance, because it was semi-purified and uh, perhaps interesting, I discovered that it was immunosuppressive. Is there a chance with cyclosporin that baby Faye could live a normal life, or at least as long as the baboon heart is useful to her? I think the question is difficult to answer because a newborn baby has no preformed antibodies. That is, it is not mature when it is born to produce antibodies. The so antibodies he has come from the mother. 
However, it can mount a rejection uh, crisis because the so-called other part of the immune system, which is cell-mediated, is already mature. A rejection crisis. This week, that is exactly what Baby Faye's body has been doing. No one yet knows whether an animal organ is just too foreign for her body to accept, even with the help of cyclosporin and other drugs. For cyclosporin was actually meant for human-to-human -human transplants. Well, today, more than 6,000 transplant patients have received the drug. This is a story that could be any family's story. It's the story of a very sick young man. 18-year-old Kerry Kopanen is in desperate need of an organ transplant. Kerry has only one working kidney, and it is failing him fast. Weak, tired, and out of breath, his body has already rejected two kidney transplants. This time, the donor will be his mother. And this time, they are putting high hopes in cyclosporin. What I heard about it was um, how it works. It takes away the, it doesn't kill off the antibodies. It just pulls them away from the kidney or, and uh, I heard it tastes terrible. I always wanted to give him my kidney, and, but now, and Dr. Bat told us that we have 90% chance. I'm more than happy to do it. Tomorrow, I'm going to donate my kidney for him. That very next day, as Carrie was wheeled toward one operating room, his mother was already in an adjoining room, Suction here, please. where the longer process of removing a kidney was underway. For Carrie's mother, losing one kidney will result in few side effects. For Kerry, it will allow him a new life. All right, can we start? Get, starting to get a little sleepy, Kerry. Oh, we're going for it now? Yeah, think of pleasant things. A car, just I would love to. a car. You would love a car, yeah. huh? I'm just gonna put it lightly over your face. Kerry's surgeon has timed precisely when to begin the operation, so to be ready at the same moment when Kerry's mother's kidney is being removed. Her right kidney has been chosen as the one to be transplanted, and it will be placed alongside the three non-working kidneys that still remain inside Carrie's abdomen. We have to give suction, though. After nearly two hours on the operating table, the crucial moment has come. The kidney is placed into a container of ice before it's carried into the adjoining operating room. Kidney transplants like this one have become almost commonplace, 6,000 last year alone. In most cases, patients do have minor bouts with rejection, but cyclosporin has been able to overcome them. In fact, the success rate for transplant patients is now greater than 90% for the critical first year. Kerry will have to take a daily dose of cyclosporin for the rest of his life. And like baby Fay, we are told by his surgeon, he was getting an early dose during the operation. He is uh, receiving it right now. As a matter of fact, that bottle that is dripping is cyclosporin. Okay, now let's lower the kidney down. Kerry would go home just a week after the operation, a hospital record. We caught up with him after a month. Tell me, how much medication are you taking now? Uh, I'm taking cyclosporum, mm -hmm. uh, 440 uh, mm -hmm. milligrams. And how much uh, prednisone are you taking? 20. 20 milligrams? Right. I think that's uh, the one medication we have to start tapering off. You're beginning right. to get a little bit... Uh, yes, I noticed that. Yeah. Okay. But although Carrie's puffiness was not due to the cyclosporin, it would get much, much worse. Six months later, we raised a question of side effects with him. I haven't experienced any uh, that I can think of. Um, the uh, chubby cheeks are from the cyclos... Uh, from the uh, pregnisone. But I can't uh, think of anything from the cyclosporin itself. Although prednisone, a steroid, is the cause of the puffiness, cyclosporin, it turns out, also has side effects of its own. It does cause uh, some hairiness, some hirsutism, uh, which is of uh, considerable concern to young ladies. Uh, men, of course, don't mind that at all. It does make it difficult for us to control high blood pressure in the patients who are on cyclosporin compared to the patients in the past. It also has some bad effect on the kidney. But according to a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, there is a more serious side effect, the possibility of cancer. 
critics of the drug. Yet the man who discovered cyclosporin says these side effects can be avoided by simply lowering the dose. By lowering the drug, the drug or switching to conventional immunosuppression, you get rid of these side effects. So I think today one has learned to use cyclosporin, especially in connection with steroids, in order that you can largely avoid the side effect. The pros are that you have more kidneys working and more patients, and more hearts and more livers and more lungs. The cons are that it's expensive and that it may have long-term damage to the kidney that we haven't yet understood because the duration of exposure to cyclosporin is only two or three years so far at most. Cyclosporin is expensive. The bill comes to $6,000 a year for each transplant patient. And though baby Faye's expenses are covered, many cannot afford the drug. To help out, earlier this year, sponsors of the National Organ Transplant Act attempted to get the government to pick up that tab. But that portion of the bill was turned down. With the Medicare trust fund in some danger, of, uh, of running out of money, uh, we believe that a great deal more consideration should be given to the issue of adding additional programs. Other drugs are already covered because they are given in the hospital. Ironically, cyclosporin is not covered at the present time because the patients take it outside of the hospital. Since it does a better job and is associated with a greater success rate, it should be covered as well. In fact, the government does pay for the time-consuming and less effective alternative to receiving a transplant, kidney dialysis. And that process costs four times as much as cyclosporin, up to $25,000 a year per patient. Now, isn't it ridiculous that they'll pay $25,000 a year for dialysis, but not add on an amendment for $6,000? Maureen Oak's father suffers directly because of cyclosporin's high cost. Donald Oaks received a transplant because the drug worked. Today, his insurance does not cover cyclosporin, and he can no longer afford to keep taking it. My father has approximately four bottles left, enough for one month, after which time there is no more medication. They gave him his life back. Now they're taking it away. Carrie Kopanen is much luckier. His insurance policy covers outpatient medication. Today, he's healthy and stable, and he's back at school. I'm not tired at all. My energy has increased immensely, and I can't sit still. So it's a wonderful feeling for a change, just to uh, go out and uh, not get tired. And for Baby Faye tonight, a very positive prediction. Babyface doctor, in a copyrighted interview in the American Medical News, says that if all goes well, she could reach her 21st birthday without the need for further surgery. The rejection factor is still a mystery to doctors, as is the precise way cyclosporin works. And yet all agree, despite the drug's problems, it has given new hope to the future of transplants. Sweet little baby. I had read, as everybody else did, about cyclosporin. I didn't really know what it did and, until yeah. now. Do you know how Baby Faye is? I talked to them at the center at, uh, at Loma Linda uh, just a few hours ago, and they, the word there is that the baby is stable and the condition is unchanged from yesterday. Well, I had talked to them yesterday, and that report said that, that the rejection episode is expected to end. It wasn't getting any worse. They expect her to recover from that, and that she's free of infection. And I think this is significant because this means that even at full dosage, the cyclosporin had not depressed her immune system enough to keep her from fighting off germs. Well, was, was, was the, uh, the heart being rejected because she was not getting enough cyclosporin? Yeah, they reduced the dosage because there are side effects to I it. See. And I think the whole thing is they have to kind of juggle that dosage to, yeah. to find the right dosage. But it looks like, the, like cyclosporin um, has some uh, promise to it. Well, she is in all our hearts. Indeed so. Incidentally, we had intended to bring you a report on a drug story that is not filled with such promise. It has to do with people who are endangering lives and property while on the job because they are taking drugs, alcohol and other drugs. We will have that story later on, on a later broadcast. Now, <laughs> this next story knocks me out. You saw it. I you know, know what I'm talking me about. Me too. Right? You're going to meet a woman else. that even President, uh, uh, President Reagan agrees is one of a kind. She is Mrs. T. And what makes her something special? 
Bob Brown is going to tell us right after this. From the moment you open it, you know this is no ordinary wine. At Taylor California Cellars, we don't just pick fine varietal grapes, we orchestrate them. Taylor California Cellars is a better wine, but don't take our word for it. Taste the music. Mitsubishi believes you put a better picture on television by putting better thinking inside. Technology so extraordinary, it produces a color television picture that is incredibly rich, incredibly vivid. Whether you're watching in your living room, your den, or with 50,000 of your closest friends. Introducing the new Jeep Wagoneer Limited. With a luxurious leather interior not available in the Buick Estate Wagon, a larger standard engine than Volvo GLT Wagon, and even more cargo space than Dodge Caravan. And Jeep Wagoneer has one thing none of them have. It lets you shift on the fly from two-wheel to four-wheel drive. Get Wagoneer luxury in four-wheel drive, only in a Jeep. Huh? Can you help me with these Canon personal copiers? Oh, yeah, they're terrific. And you know, they copy in six colors. I know. Well, the entire copying process is in this cartridge. Look, so you can maintain it yourself. I know. This one even reduces and enlarges and makes copies up to legal size. I ought to know. I'm just. Oh, I know. Well, if you know all about Canon PC copies, what do you need me for? Mm -hmm. Over here. You should have known. For information, call toll-free. She has the world on a string and puts a smile on everyone she meets, from children of all ages to the President of the United States. Bob Brown with the story of Mrs. T. She's something special when 2020 continues. Saturday on CFA College Football. Number one, Nebraska comes for the Big 8 Championship against sixth ranked Oklahoma. Or Cotton Bowl hopefuls clash when Texas meets TCU. And on Monday Night Football, the division leading Steelers tackle the Saints. Fantastic football, only on ABC. In five years when you retire, you'll have the time for a $5,000 cruise. But it costs less than $3,000 in a Mellon certificate now. Gloria. You've got to see this. What is it, Mr. Simpson? It's the Brother Typograph, and it's amazing. At the touch of a button, it automatically plots four-color pie graphs, line graphs, and bar graphs. It types in four colors. It's a typewriter that types large, standard, and small. Even has a calculator. Dad, when I told you you could use my typograph, I didn't mean you could keep it. <laughs> Gloria, it's perfect for students, home, office, travel, and you can buy it for less than $300. From Channel 4, WTAE-TV, this is an Action News Brief. Good evening. Two men are in Allegheny General Hospital tonight after the helicopter they were in crashed into the woods in Butler County. Researchers in Pittsburgh may have discovered a way to treat sickle cell anemia, a disease that affects thousands of black Americans every year. And the crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery is getting ready to come home. The crew is packing the gear tonight. They'll be landing about 7 a.m. These stories and more tonight at 11. If you are lucky, if you believe that heaven smiles on you, then at least once in your life you'll encounter someone like the woman you're about to meet. And if you could bottle the tonic that she brings to those who do meet her, you'd want to shower it on the world. Bob Brown has the story of this powerhouse of a person, a woman who, no matter what her name was, would still leave everybody smiling. She drives a blue Volkswagen bus full of stuffed birds and animals. A strange sight if you pass her by on the highway in Marin County, California, less so if you realize, as you will see later, 
that this is a lady for whom the President of the United States flapped his arms like a seagull. This is Mrs. T, who says, spend your day at home doing chores and you will never remember it. Spend the day with me and you will never forget it. Hi, folks. Come on in the circle. Circle time. <laughs> in a straw hat fastened to her chin by a yellow length of yarn, Mrs. T, who is 75, spends six days a week leading nature tours in Marin County. She does not accept pay for it. She's been doing this work for 30 years, beginning each new trip by gathering a circle to say hello to the elements. I say, good morning, Mr. Sun. Good morning, Mr. Sun. I say, hi, blue sky. The first responses are always a little self-conscious. Would you two pick up those two? You should know, by the way, that these stuffed animals were not killed. They were brought to Mrs. T by people who found them after they had died, or by fish and wildlife workers, or she finds them herself. And she's had them stuffed so children can study closely the wildlife they may see that day. When Mrs. T talks about them, it is with the wisdom and experience of a 75-year-old woman who still has the soul of a child discovering nature for the first time. When you see their fur, when you see their tail, when you see the colors of their teeth, or the colors of the feathers on the bird, how each one is different, each animal, everything is different. The wonders of nature. Everyone has aches and pains and problems, but go in the out of doors and your problems fall off. Follow me. And life becomes more real. And there are two words you will hear repeatedly from Mrs. T. Something special. Look Something special. Tree. It may be a leaf. There he goes. There he goes. Or the cry of a bird. Let's say hi, Mr. Scarab Beetle. Or something you would have stepped on the day before. They are all something special to Mrs. T. Hi. Look how he walks. He can walk upside down. To many of the children she leads into these areas, Mrs. T is like one of those magical characters who show up in stories and fables always appearing at just the right moment in childhood to offer help or teach an important lesson. She's a little like Mary Poppins, but even more like Merlin in The Sword and the Stone, who tutors a young King Arthur by transforming him into the creatures of the forests and streams. Well, do you know who that was? Put some blue on top of your head, put on your blue wings, put on your white shirt, and some gray on your back. That's Mr. Scrub Jay. Let's say, hi, Mr. Scrub Jay. Hi. This is the reason why her teaching method is so special. Put those four pads down in the dust. By imagining that they're painting themselves the color of a bird or an animal, or by scratching an animal's tracks into the dust, the children begin to put themselves in the animal's place. What if a child uh, squashed a bug? What would you tell that child? Can you make a back like that? Can you make antennae like that? Can you make wings like that? Please go stand underneath that tree over there and tell Mother Nature you're sorry. You won't ever do that again. You are appealing to the kindness in a child. How can they help something else? Hold up three fingers. Put a pair of scissors in this hand. Cut sharp. Mrs. T doesn't conduct her nature tours just for children. She also takes groups of adults. She just doesn't treat them any differently. Pick up a brown leaf like this and hold it by your finger. Who is this woman and where does she come from? Well, her full name is Elizabeth Cooper Terwilliger. She was born on a sugar plantation in Hawaii where her father was a doctor and her mother took her on lots of outdoor trips. She moved to California to get a nursing degree and that's where she met the man you see here, Calvin Terwilliger, an orthopedic surgeon he remembers that she not only wanted to repaint the medical clinic he worked in when they met, she even wanted to paint the vices he used to adjust leg braces. Calvin thought it was a better idea to go hiking with her. He just retired this year, but in a workshop that also serves as an examining room for the birds and animals that had died in the wild and were preserved by Mrs. T's taxidermist, Calvin still has a practice of sorts. What do you call this place? This is the resurrection ward. This is where the dead ones are made uh, live again. 
Dr. Terwilliger helps brace up all the stuffed animals after the children have undone even the most skillful examples of taxidermy. Now, what are you doing here with these? Well, this is a great blue heron, and uh, they have a very vulnerable neck. And the children uh, are very enthusiastic about handling these birds. And frequently, we end up with an emergency case with a fractured cervical spine and broken neck. We have a temporary wrapping on this. This is simply first aid. This is not professional <laughs> taxidermy work in any sense of the word. Although both Dr. and Mrs. T have kept busy schedules all their lives, there is one day of the week they reserve for each other, Sunday. We go canoeing and we go hiking and we go biking together. But he doesn't know the birds or the flowers or the plants. Well, wait a second, you've been married 40 some odd That's right, years. we were married in 1939. And he still hasn't learned his birds? Little by little, he's learning it. She's probably already told you this, but she says you don't, you still don't know your birds very well. Oh, no, no, that takes a while. I was much more interested in her than I was in the <laughs> ducks. Mrs. T's persistence as a teacher got her some special recognition this year. Last spring, she left this scenery behind for a few days and took a plane to Washington, where she was among a group of people to be honored for their lifetimes of volunteer work. In your own way, you're working to resolve issues in a more effective manner than we could do with large federal programs. None of the recipients was supposed to speak at this ceremony. They were just supposed to get their medals and sit down. But Washington planners have never met with the likes of Mrs. T. So as Master of Ceremonies Tom Pawkins spoke, she edged closer and closer to the president. So I just put my arm around the president, he put his arm around me, and I looked at Mr. Pawkins and thought, I better listen to what he's saying. And Mr. Pawkins said, Mrs. Twilliger was the only person out there picking up litter. I thought, that's my cue. And what do you think were her first words? Something special. Will you all please say after me, please, this is my country. <laughs> Wherever I go, I will leave it more beautiful than I found it. And then I thought, while I'm there and I have a captive audience and I love a captive audience, I'll do the bird flight pattern. Now put your arms above your shoulders. <laughs> now put your arms out straight. Straight out for a hawk, let's say that. Now go slowly, never in a hurry for a seagull, let's say It that. may be hard to remember the last time a president did this kind of thing in public, but it's probably even harder to remember the last time someone said no to Mrs. T. <laughs> and then you are a crane. Thank you. <laughs> she may not be Mother Nature, but why take the chance? And we know that there's a tunnel right underneath here. It wouldn't be very hard for a lot of children to believe that you are Mother Nature. Mother Nature is bigger than I am and great. Because she made all the flowers, the plants, the birds, the trees, and all the weather. She's somebody who's here, but we cannot see her. She is here to look after things, and there is a plan that she has for the great out of doors. with Mrs. T ends with a string of farewells. Goodbye, Ocean! Goodbye, Ocean! Bye, Mr. Sun! Except in the hours that have passed, it is easier to put your heart into it. You feel less self-conscious when you speak to the elements. And a little sad that Mrs. T is also saying goodbye to you. Goodbye! Goodbye! Bye! But then again, Mrs. T never says goodbye for long. She's wonderful. She makes you she makes you want to cry as well as laugh. Where did you ever find her? Well, the uh, camera crew that uh, took those pictures, Terry and Donna Morrison, told us about her. And at first we thought, well, you know, what can you do with a nature walk? Yeah, another, yeah. And then KGO, the ABC station in San Francisco, showed us the pictures of her casting a spell over uh, <laughs> President Reagan. And I thought, I have to meet this lady. 
And as it turns out, she's an institution in the, in the Bay Area. There's a nature education center named for her and a three-year waiting list uh, to sign up yeah. for the tours that she gives. I can see why, because she takes the ordinary. I mean, she takes a beetle. It's a beetle. And, and somehow makes it fascinating, isn't it? To exactly. Yeah. And, she, and she has that extraordinary ability to help children or adults empathize with the animals they see right down to the the scarab beetle. She is something special. She is a rare bird herself. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> we'll be right back. Which computer company is making more room in the computer room? A company with the technology to build a computer system that's more powerful and more reliable than its older cousins, but a whole lot smaller. That company is NCR. Hello? Your new computer's here. Their computer's everything the big computers were, except big. Innovative computer technology. You can expect it from NCR. Smile. Is that the new Nikon? Yes. Get in there and I'll get your picture. Just push the button. Announcing the Nikon One Touch. Oh, is that the Nikon? Hmm? Let me. A lightweight 35 millimeter camera that anyone can use. Just push. Is that the new Nikon? Just push. Even if they've never picked one up before. Just push. The autofocus, auto flash, auto everything Nikon One Touch. Now everyone can take great pictures. Say cheese! Cheese! <laughs> this is the dawn of a new kind of automotive thinking forward thinking that refuses to accept the idea that anything with four doors is by definition boring. The result, a fuel injected four-door sedan that doesn't look or act like a four-door sedan. Ford Temple, a forward thinking car. Have you driven the best built American cars? Have you driven a Ford lately? AT&T is in paper. Trucks software. How? With a new program called AT&T Opportunity Calling for Business. It can help small business earn a dollar's credit on these and other name brand products for each dollar spent on AT&T long distance service. That savings off the best price you can find. Our catalog is coming to your office. Look for it. AT&T Communications. We can help your business in ways you never thought of. Sunday. Living with you hasn't exactly been a walk in the park. Oh, it has. Hard Castle and McCormick are splitting up. Where are you, standing in the soup line? <laughs> but look who's laughing now. Then. <laughs> Bill Murray and Harold Ramis, those guys from Ghostbusters. That's the fact, Jack. And now busting up the army. Strikes, all starting at 8, 7 Central. Sunday. You know, watching baby Faye lying there on, on our piece trying to get well brings to mind the fact that some of the criticism of the doctors brought up the subject of medical experimenting with the, at the, you know, at the risk of a human and, and uh, at the mm -hmm. expense of an animal. And I think we have to be careful about categorically condemning medical experiments because if at the time, if, if at that moment of choice, and the parents had an informed choice, the grandmother now says, the best way to save the baby's life was to use a baboon heart, and that became a medical experiment, so be it. Well, also, this baby would have died. It isn't as if the, baby, if the baby had been left alone, it would have lived. But you know, Hugh, at the time, there were uh, animal lovers who protested that one baboon had to die, that maybe others might have. I love animals. I just came back from Africa. Baboons were plentiful. They're and not endangered. They're That's not true. endangered. That's and if it saves the life of this baby or future babies, I can't understand the protest. Exactly. Also tonight, this follow-up to our story, the wheels fall off. Last June, we reported that the rear wheels were falling off some trucks and vans made by the Ford Motor Company. The vehicles, models E350 and F350, are often sold to truck and van rental companies, and the problem came to our attention when a former employee of the U-Haul company, Larry Barone of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, wrote to us about it. Well, two weeks ago, the Department of Transportation asked Ford to voluntarily recall the vehicles. Ford has not yet announced a recall. Well, now here's Ted Koppel with a word about tonight's Nightline. Hugh, our topic tonight is fear as an instrument of power, how it's used in the marketplace by executives trying to get more out of their subordinates. 
And we'll also look at why the prospect of being scared to death keeps packing people into movie theaters. And that's Nightline, following your local news. That also is 2020 for tonight. We're in touch, so you be in touch. I'm Hugh Downs. I'm Barbara Walters. And for all of us at 2020, good night. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, coverage of the landing of the space shuttle Discovery. Also, Jane Fonda and Pia Zadora on Good Morning America. Saturday, Romano's in the wrong place at the wrong time when a killer firebombs Hooker's car on T.J. Hooker. Then a mixed-up married couple try to make their fantasies come true when they change partners on The Love Boat. Later tonight, following ABC News Nightline, a visit to Austria on Eye on Hollywood. If you would like a transcript of tonight's broadcast, send $3 to Journal Graphics, Box 2020, and Sonia Station, New York, New York, 10023. This has been the ABC News Magazine, 2020. I'm Peter Jennings. Tomorrow on ABC's World News Tonight, preventing the sexual abuse of children. You can punish a molester after the crime. We'll look at ways to help children become less vulnerable. Does your body belong to you? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Tomorrow on ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Only a mile from landing safely at an airport, this helicopter apparently ran out of gas, sending both men in it to a hospital. Firefighters battle a three-alarm blaze on Mount Washington. Negotiations continue in the South Viet teacher strike. And the space shuttle Discovery is getting set to come home. Good evening, I'm Don Cannon. And Action News is coming up next. Break away to Foodland for double coupons and holiday savings. Like gold medal flour in the five-pound bag, 69 cents with coupon. The 12-ounce can of Tropicana frozen orange juice is 99 cents. Four three-ounce boxes of royal gelatin are a dollar with coupon. The two-liter bottle of Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, or Mountain Dew is 97 cents plus tax. And USDA Grade A self-basting turkeys, any size, just 65 cents a pound. Break away to Foodland. Announcing Buick Front Wheel.